So we're in a series called Hashtag Blessed, right? Um, and so if you're new, uh, what we're looking at in this series is really this idea that uh, on social media, a lot of times you'll see a hashtag. This is hashtag blessed. Typically what that means is something good happened in my life. And so I feel like God is blessing me in this moment. So, you know, I got a new car, I'm hashtag blessed. I got to go on vacation, hashtag blessed. Uh, I got a promotion at work, hashtag blessed. Didn't get fired at work, hashtag blessed, right? So it can be a lot of different things, you know, in that moment, but it typically has to do with something good that I wanted or expected or didn't expect in my life that, that I'm now grateful for. The, you know, the reality is though, is that as Pastor Brian's been sharing that sometimes our idea of what it means to be blessed doesn't always align with what scripture teaches us that it means to be blessed. And so in this series, we're walking through six different passages. We've got today and one more week, uh, Kate will be preaching next week about about uh, another part to this, where we've been looking at what does the Bible say about what it means to be biblically blessed? And so today, I know this, is that you are gonna be so encouraged after I read these two verses that we're just gonna leave because there's gonna be nothing else that I'm gonna say to you that's gonna encourage you because you're gonna be so uplifted after we read these and what it means to be blessed. And so stand up with me. Let's read these verses together. We're really not gonna leave. Don't get excited. I was being sarcastic. <laughs> Some of you guys are like, this is the greatest Sunday. I'm glad Brian's gone. Um, I mean, we can just run the, want to run the loop online. Nobody knows. We can just take off. Anyway, uh, hashtag blessed, right? We got out early. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so we say this phrase, the very words after we read the main text reading each week to distinguish God's word from my own. Here's what Jesus says. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the son of man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. Now you know I was being, you have a seat. Now you know I was being sarcastic because if you're new today, you're like, man, I, I came to church, I was hoping for some encouragement, and that did not do it, right? Well, it, it didn't, maybe on the surface, but as we've been talking about, so often what we, what we think and, and see as blessing is sometimes different than what Jesus teaches us or the scriptures teach us. So uh, Luke is recording the teaching of Jesus, and it's very similar to the teaching that we find in Matthew chapter 5 with the Sermon on the Mount. Some people call this Luke's Sermon on the Plain, right? Some people, you know, debate whether or not it was Jesus teaching a similar message that he taught in the Sermon on the Mount at a different time. Was it the same thing? And they just recorded it in two different places in their, their own accounts of the life of Jesus. You know, others uh, think maybe, hey, Luke, Jesus Jesus probably talked about this more than once, but regardless, what we find here is very similar to what we find in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 and 12, where Jesus is talking about what it means to be blessed in the kingdoms. So let's read Matthew 5, 10 through 12. It says this way, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we see both Luke and Matthew recording this teaching of Jesus that, that to summarize says this, blessed are you when you are persecuted. Now, again, that's not going to, you know, sell a lot of bumper stickers. It's not going to, you know, be tattooed to a lot of people's forearms or bodies, you know, and, and all the verses that people do. It's, it's one of those that we read and we're like, okay, um, I don't, I mean, I'm glad I'm blessed, but I really hope that never applies to me. Because I don't know about you, but I didn't wake up this morning thinking, you know what would bless my life today? Somebody hating me. I really hope somebody insults me today. I really hope somebody reviles me and considers my name as evil. No, I woke up thinking I was blessed because the Cowboys don't play till the night. And after preaching, I could really use a nap and don't want to miss the game, right? <laughs> because that's how we think of blessing. But Jesus says, listen, blessed are you when you're persecuted. So here's what I want to do in our time today is I want to just look real practically and, and, and plainly maybe at what two questions. Number one, what can we learn about being biblically blessed from this teaching of Jesus? What can we learn? And then and the second big question is this, is how should we live in light of this teaching? 
from Jesus today. And so if you're taking notes, write this down. There's also some blanks you can fill in in your worship guide if you're a, a person that likes to do that as we walk through this. So what do we learn from this teaching? Well, the first thing is what we talked about, that we are blessed when we face persecution, that we are blessed when we face persecution. So Luke chapter six, verse 22, Jesus says, blessed are you when. So again, this idea of blessing, this idea of happy, content, fulfilled, favored, saying, listen, you are blessed. You are held up in the kingdom of God and the value of the kingdom, right? Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, and when they revile you and spurn your neighbor's evil. Matthew said it this way in verse 5, 10, blessed are those who are persecuted. Well, what does it mean to be persecuted? How do we define persecution? Well, I put a bunch of different definitions together and here's really what, what I came up with was, was this, is that to be persecuted is hostility and ill treatment directed toward you. It's persistent annoyance or harassment. To harass or punish in a manner designed to injure, to grieve or to afflict. And it's often based on a person's beliefs and their behaviors. It's often resulting from a religious belief that someone has. So persecution is when somebody comes after you, opposes you, harms you, insults you, goes after you in a way that will injure you, that will grieve you, that will afflict you, that will make your life harder and more difficult. Jesus says, blessed are you when you are persecuted. He says this, if you go back, he says, blessed are you when you face. So it's interesting. He doesn't say if you face. He says when you face persecution or when people hate you. It's the idea that, that listen, that you should not be surprised as a follower of Jesus if through your faithful fellowship of him as your Lord and Savior, you experience persecution. It says when you experience persecution, there's gonna be specific seasons and times where we're going to have, as followers of Jesus, people push against us, insult us, hate us, not be for us because of our following Jesus Christ. What does persecution look like? Jesus lists off a couple of things. It says, when they hate you. This is not just a casual dislike. This is due to detest, to loathe, to, to openly go against. When they exclude you. When they remove you from social settings, circles, relationships, family, they consider you unclean or outcast, right? When they insult you, when they say to your name all kinds of things that are not positive or uplifting, when they, when they lie about you, when they defame you. It says when they reject your name as evil, when they basically say, Zach is not a good person. Zach is an evil person. Or insert your name in the statement. And we see persecution historically throughout the, the Bible as well as throughout history that Christians have, in fact, as Jesus said, faced persecution. We see it in the life of Jesus to begin with, that Jesus was persecuted. He was insulted. He was defamed. He was beaten. He was murdered by those who opposed him. We see that Paul was the chief persecutor of Christians. And then when he had the, the experience on the road to Damascus and he became a follower of Jesus, he became one who was persecuted by those who used to rally and be on his side. Stephen, one of the early disciples, early followers of Jesus was, was stoned for his faith. Christians in the Roman Empire were, were, were slaughtered under Nero and, um, and, and different, uh, different Caesars, different rulers. Men like Polycarp, early church fathers were, were, were publicly killed because they, they, they refused to renounce their faith in Jesus Christ. And it continued all throughout history. And it continues today through the, in much of our world, this, this same more, more serious threat of persecution. I was studying this week and came across a report by a group called Open Doors, and it's a world watch list. And they, they track uh, over year to year persecution amongst Christians um, all throughout the world on a global scale. And here's what they found in 2021, that 340 million Christians, that's one in eight across the globe, are living in places with very high or extreme levels of persecution. 340 million Christians. To put that in perspective, the population of the United States is 326 million people. 
So globally, there are more Christians today under severe threat or extreme levels of persecution than there are people in the United States of America. Each day, 13 Christians are killed because of their faith all across the world. Each day, an average of 12 churches or Christian buildings are attacked simply because of their affiliation with Christ. Every day, 12 Christians on average are unjustly arrested or imprisoned, and another five are abducted because of their faith in Jesus Christ. So persecution is not a historical thing. Persecution is a real thing across our globe. Well, what does that look like for, for you and me, right? You know, we live in the United States. We have the freedom to worship. We can come and gather in this place and not have to fear doing that today. So how do we reconcile this idea of, of persecution maybe in our, our own life? And I, I tell you, I struggled this week really trying to, trying to hold in one hand the fact that there are people in the world today who, who gathered together under threat of their life. And we were able to come today and, and say, how do I apply just this idea of persecution to my life? And here's really where, where I came to, was that in the West, primarily for many of us, we're, we will experience or do experience more of a subtle or mild form of persecution. Maybe opposition's a better word if you don't feel like you can own that persecution word based upon what maybe others are experiencing. But what I came to is this, is that whether we experience a more subtle form of persecution or a more extreme form of persecution, the response has to be the same. It's a call to faithfulness. And so we can't just ignore the scripture because maybe we're not being persecuted on the same level as somebody else. We actually have a responsibility to live out our lives in faithfulness the same way that they are called. We just have the opportunity to maybe do that with a little more ease and less trepidation. Because the reality is this, is that we still face insult. We still face ex exclusion. We still face, you know, insults and, 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 and all these different things we see here. And I just thought of it some different ways. You know, many of our students junior high and high school, they, they go to school in a place where they, if they stand up for their faith, they are insulted. They are left out. They are considered different or weird. Many who go to college experience, you know, just a, a resistance or an opposition that because of their biblical beliefs or what they believe about Jesus, that they're closed-minded, they're old-fashioned, or they're just not very intelligent. Sometimes we and others are left out of social gatherings and relationships because they, they, they know that we won't do what maybe they're going to do or we exclude ourselves because everybody at work is going to X and we don't feel that the right place for me to go is to go and do X. Sometimes we're criticized at work and, and we're considered not to be a team player because we want to hold integrity over productivity. We want to hold character over profit. So maybe the, the ways that, that the lines are skirted that are just kind of the norm, we feel are actually out of bounds when it comes to how we should live as faithful followers of Jesus. Maybe you get left out and made fun of because you don't entertain the gossip and the drama that happens at your workplace or your neighborhood. You maybe some have even faced criticism within the church by other followers of Jesus because you take your faith, quote unquote, too seriously. The reality is this, is no matter what form of persecution we may face, when we face persecution, Jesus says we are blessed. That's the first thing. Number two, not only are we blessed when we face persecution, we also learn from this passage that persecution, this persecution that Jesus is talking about stems from our allegiance to Jesus. See, there's a difference between facing opposition and, and maybe hatefulness just because the world is broken and the world is messed up than what Jesus is talking about here. The, the persecution that Jesus is talking about here directly stems from our allegiance and faithfulness to Jesus Christ. Look what it says, Luke chapter 6, verse 22. It says, Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. So this is not just talking about general hardship. It's not just talking about people not liking you. 
The reality is that sometimes people will oppose us, people will not like us because we're not very likable. You, you, you can't be a jerk for Jesus and then get mad and call it persecution. You're just being a jerk, right? So we gotta own a little bit maybe if people are opposing us or they're persecuting us and say, okay, why are they persecuting me? Are they persecuting me or are they persecuting Jesus in and through me? Because that's really where persecution becomes. And it's specifically related to how we are following after Jesus. When we are living like Jesus, loving like Jesus, believing like Jesus and following his ways, if we are persecuted, if we're opposed, if we're insulted, if people are harming us because of that, that is the persecution that Jesus is talking about here. You know, I fear if we just label every time people don't agree with us or, or, or don't, don't, don't like us or don't you know, just go along with us as persecution, we, we really minimize to a detriment real persecution that we face and others face. So it's important that we understand the context of this passage is facing persecution that directly stems from me being so much like Jesus. People can't stand it because they can't stand Jesus. Matthew said it, Matthew 5, 10, he said this way, he said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Again, not just because we're not likable, not just because we're, you know, um, we hold a certain viewpoint or a certain, you know, ideology. It's because we are living our life for Jesus. Well, so what, what happens? How do we respond when that persecution comes? Well, that's the third thing. We can rejoice in the midst of persecution is that you and I, when we face persecution because of our faith in Jesus, because of our living for Jesus, we can respond with, with joy and rejoice in the midst of persecution. So what are we supposed to do? Jesus says, you're blessed. And here's what you're supposed to do. Look at verse uh, Luke 6, 23 again. It says, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. It's not just like a, a small rejoicing, like, yay. It's like, I mean, it's a leaping for joy. That we should, when we face persecution, because of our faith in Jesus Christ, because of our faithfulness to him, we should respond with rejoicing. John Stott's, uh, uh, he's passed away now, but he was a, a, a longtime pastor in the UK and commentator and theologian. And, and he said this about, about how we should respond. This is his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's account of this. And he says this, he says that we are not to retaliate like an unbeliever, not to sulk like a child, not to lick our wounds and self-pity like a dog, not to grin and bear it like a stoic, still less to pretend we enjoy it like a masochist. What then? We're to rejoice as a Christian should rejoice and even leap for joy. I'll be honest with you, when I read that, I, th I thought to myself, the times in my life where maybe I've faced opposition or maybe what I would consider a, a, a subtle form of persecution, my initial reaction wasn't always to leap for joy. It was more to sulk like a child. I'm not sure I licked my wounds like a dog, but I did self-pity myself. Maybe I just grinned and bared, or maybe I was like, yeah, they hate me for Jesus. That's a great thing. But he said, listen, we're to rejoice. Well, well Why? Why is, why is joy, why is rejoicing the proper response to persecution? Well, look at number four. Because we are promised a great heavenly reward. Why do we rejoice at persecution? Because of what God has promised us and Jesus has promised us through faith in him. Look back at verse six, uh, chapter six, verse 23. It says, rejoice in that day and leap for joy for behold, your reward is great in heaven. We can rejoice and should rejoice in persecution because though we lose everything here on earth, we gain everything in heaven. Though we are cast out, though we are insulted, though we are persecuted, though we are killed for our faith, we can respond with joy because of the promise of what is to come in Jesus. And I'll be honest with you, that's easier said than done. But that is what we are called to do. But it's not just that we have the promise of God to, joy, to rejoice in. 
But we also have in these moments the presence of God to rejoice in. Look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 20 on the screen. Jesus is giving the the great commission. So it's his his marching orders for his disciples and all of his followers that would come about what they are to be about. And he said to go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them like we did today. By the way, we were able to baptize not just this service, but, but four more people this morning, which is an amazing thing. To see restoration come. He said, listen, go and do that. But here's how he concluded that. He said, and behold... I am with you always to the end of the age. He gave us and gives us his presence. And so we can rejoice because of his promise, but also because of the presence that, he, that is with us when we face persecution. And here's the fifth thing, is that we are in good company when we face persecution. We can learn, we learn through this passage that we're in good company when we face persecution. When we face persecution, we join with those who have gone before us and those who are going through it with us, who are standing firm in their faith, who are being faithful and choosing joy. We don't suffer alone. And their faithfulness encourages our faithfulness. And our faithfulness can encourage their faithfulness. That's why faithfulness matters. We'll actually talk about that in a minute. We see in verse 23 again, he says, Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward in heaven is great, or is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. He's saying, listen, this is not something new in this age. Followers of Jesus have been persecuted for their faith. The Old Testament prophets have been persecuted for their faith. And you're joining together with a great multitude of faithful men and women who have stood in the midst of persecution. And so we're in good company when we face persecution. So how should we respond to all of this? Because that's the easy part, right? You can pick out the, the things that we learned from that passage. We can, we can understand that, that we're blessed when we're persecuted, that, that persecution that Jesus is talking about stems from our, our lives being, being a, a faithful in allegiance to Jesus. We can rejoice because we have a great heavenly reward and we're in good company, but, but how do we live tomorrow knowing that the reality of persecution at some level may be before us? I wanna share six things with you quickly and we'll be done. First thing is this, is how should we live in light of this teaching? Well, I think we need to prepare for persecution, but not fear it. We need to prepare for persecution, but not fear Fear it. In John 15, 20, Jesus told his disciples and tells us, he says, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Once again, we see that persecution is not something that we should be surprised by, but we should be prepared for. To be prepared for. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German theologian and, and, and pastor and, and was a martyr for his faith. And he was, he was known uh, as one who was persecuted primarily because of how he applied his faith in historical context uh, in opposition to the Nazi regime. And he said this about what it really means to, to be prepared and, and to have a right understanding, but also not to fear persecution. He says this, discipleship means allegiance to a suffering Christ. And it's therefore not at all surprising that Christians should be called upon to suffer. In fact, it's a joy and a token of his grace. So we should prepare for persecution, but not fear it. Well, why should we not fear persecution? Because of the promise of God, the presence of God in our life. And the fact that Jesus said to us that in this world, we will have trouble. But take heart, because he has overcome the world. So we need to prepare for, 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 for excuse me, persecution, but do not fear it. Second thing is this, is per, pursue, can't say all these Ps, pursue faithfulness to Jesus above all. One of the ways we prepare and be prepared is by pursuing faithfulness to Jesus above all. There, there's a biblical principle that's true in life and really applies to so many different things. And I like to say it this way, that faithfulness in the little things The easy things prepares us for faithfulness in the bigger, more difficult things. 
that being faithful to God, faithful to Jesus, when it's easy, prepares us to be faithful to Jesus when it's hard. That being faithful to Jesus in the little ways prepares us to be faithful to Jesus in the more difficult, the bigger ways. So that's why it's important to be faithful every single day because faithfulness builds the foundation for faithfulness, if that makes sense. So one of the things I think we struggle with, or I'll just say I struggle with, is when things are easy, I like to do what I like to do. And I have a tendency in those moments to not rely on Jesus because things are easy. The problem is, is that when I live my life with a pattern of not relying on Jesus, and then all of a sudden I need to rely on Jesus, it's not natural to what I do. I automatically in those times want to run back to myself as well. I want to fix my own problems, deal with things my own way. But faithfulness in the little things prepares us for faithfulness in the bigger things. Luke 16.10, Jesus says this, that one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. It's that principle. So to prepare for persecution, we need to be faithful to Jesus above all in the little things and the big things. Number three, we need to praise God for his presence and his promises. Part of that being faithful, part of that preparation is learning to praise God, to rejoice in every circumstance, in every situation, in the good times and the bad times. We learn to do that. It becomes more natural and it becomes easier to do that when it's actually harder to do that, if that makes sense. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, Paul writes this, and this is somebody who knew persecution, who understood the difficulty He said this, he said, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Have you ever asked the question, God, what is your will for my life? What is God's will? We typically ask that question when we have a big decision to make, right? Do I take this job or do I stay in the job I'm I'm at? You know, do I ask my girlfriend to marry me or do I kind of, you know, is she the right person for me, Right? Do I, do I take the, the, the relocation or do I stay where I am? Like we, we ask God, what, what do you have for me? And those are really good questions. And that's an element of God's will. But God also has a general will for all of us. And part of it is, is that we would rejoice always, pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstances. Why is that important? Because when we do that, it prepares us for difficulty and persecution. And it honors God, not just in the big, difficult things, it honors God in the everyday as well. Number four, we need to prioritize the reward that awaits us. We need to keep our eyes focused, not on what is before us, but on what is still to come. You know, when persecution comes and life becomes difficult, everything that maybe you were hanging on to can go away just like that. And if your focus and your hope is only on what is right in front of you here on this earth, when all that goes away, you're gonna find nothing to cling to. That's why we have to not be focused just on the here and now. We need to focus on that eternal reward and promise that God has given to us. Paul writes this way in Colossians 3, verse one through four. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So we're gonna keep our minds and our sights and our hopes elevated, not just to God's work in our life now, but more importantly to what God has promised that will come. And we prioritize living for that and not just living for today. Fifth thing is this. We need to pray for and support those who are facing persecution. One of the ways we can respond to the message today is not to just feel guilty because I feel persecuted, but I look at people across the world who are really persecuted. It's to do something about that. Well, what can we do here today? Well, the most basic thing we can do is we can pray. We can make it a commitment and a pattern to pray for those who find themselves in the the, the aim and the way of persecution all across the world. Because prayer matters. 
It's a way we can do what Paul says in Galatians 6 too. We can bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We need to pray that this, that this passage would become their reality and their hope in difficult times. We can pray for their comfort and their peace. Pray for as God would allow and, 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 and desire that, that they would be safe and protected. We can pray for their faithfulness to stand firm in the midst of difficulty. We can pray that the church across the world would flourish as it often does in times of persecution. And we can pray for those who are doing the persecution. That they would be like Paul on the way to persecute Christians would actually become a follower of Jesus. We can pray for and we can stand with. Well, how do we stand with those all across the world who are being persecuted in a severe way because of their faith? Well, number one, we can give to organizations that support and minister to these believers. We can advocate for freedom and religious liberty for all across the world. We can be aware and raise awareness. And we can make a commitment to stand firm and faithful in our lives as a way to encourage their faithfulness and theirs. And it's not just praying for the, the people in third world countries. It's also praying for those who would face persecution here, who are going into settings and going into situations where they, they may potentially find that opposition and persecution. Pray for them. And here's the last thing. We need to posture for love, even for those who oppose or persecute us. And I saved the best for last. And you're probably thinking, okay, I didn't see that in verse 22 or 23. Like, are you just kind of like throwing in, this is like Zach's, you know, little tag at the end. Well, you're right. It's not specifically shown in 22 and 23. But if you go down four or five verses in the same context of teaching where Jesus just said, you were gonna be persecuted and you're blessed by that, what does he say about how we should respond to people that are persecuting us, that are going after us, and that are opposing us? Here's what he says. Luke chapter 6, verse 27 and 28. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who abuse you. If it wasn't hard enough that we have to hear that we may face and will face persecution, now Jesus is saying, that in the response to that, I've got to pray for and love even the person who is the one making it difficult for me. But again, this is the economy of the kingdom. It's the call of a follower of Jesus. The person that is going after you that is talking bad about you, that is being hateful towards you, that is making your life difficult just because you're a follower of Jesus trying to live faithfully is the very person that you in faithfulness are called to pray for, to love and to serve. And it could be and it can be that the way we oftentimes respond to those even who are coming after us is actually the best witness for who we say we believe in and what we say we believe in. Even though it is so difficult. But again, we have the presence of God in our life pushing us forward in that way. So what do we learn in this passage? We learn that persecution is a reality and when it comes, we are blessed. That real persecution comes from our faithfulness to Jesus. We can rejoice in that because of our heavenly reward and we're in good company with other followers of Jesus when we face hardship and difficulty because of our faith. We also learn that we need to be prepared. We don't have to fear. We need to be faithful every day, not just when it's hard. We need to praise God for his presence and his promises. We need to prioritize the reward that comes and make that the thing we value most of all. We need to pray for and support those who find themselves in difficult, difficult times and posture for love, even to those who are unloving to us. I wonder today what our response is to the message. 
As Pastor Brian says, a disciple is one who hears and obeys. We've heard what's the step of obedience. What's the response today that God has for you? Maybe you are one who you're facing that persecution at some level. It could be that that you've made a decision to follow Christ or, or, or take your faith seriously and that's created a rift between you and other members of your family. It could be that there's an issue at work because you are faithfully pursuing integrity based upon the Bible. It could be that you're being left out or you're being criticized because you're standing for your faith in your school hallways and classes. Or it could be that you need to prepare for if and when persecution finds you and finds us. However we need to respond today, I want to invite you during this time to ask God just to speak to you and to give you the courage to take the next step he's calling you to. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day and for your word again. God, we're grateful, even grateful for difficult passages like this. God, you tell us that we are blessed when we are persecuted. That we're blessed when our faithfulness to you causes harm or difficulty to come to us. And God, though that may not be something that in our economy, from a worldly perspective, we would value, God, in the, in the kingdom, it's of great value to us. And so thank you for your promises. Thank you that we can rejoice in this. And God, we wanna pray just right now as we, we pause. I wanna pray for every, God, person in this room, watching online, and especially those millions who find themselves, God, in areas where they face extreme persecution. God, would you help your church in whatever level we can stand faithfully for you to not be dismayed or dissuaded because of difficulty but God to trust you and your promises to rely on your presence to be faithful in the little things and the big things so that your name would be known that people would come to see you as Savior Lord King of kings. Thank you, God. Amen.